Hello to everybody uh, virtually. I'm Sanjay Mantri. I'm one of the consultant ophthalmologists. Um, um, and my special interest um, is uh, cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery. And I just thought um, it's probably not a bad idea to just go through the entry segment journey and the common conditions that you come across. And, um, um, you know, some of, some of the bits I've covered uh, a bit, some of them I've covered a bit more in detail, um, and I hope you find that useful. So one of the common conditions uh, people come across um, um, is, is a recurrent colon rosin. And I think um, it's, it's a bit more common than what, what you think. Um, I, I personally think um, there's a lot of people out there with dryness and uh, a complaint of waking up in the morning with, with uh, um, either dry eye symptoms or irritation in the eye or a full-blown abrasion that we kind of sometimes forget to miss that, oh, they've approached you uh, when the epithelium is probably healed and, and you're just seeing SPKs and you're thinking, well, there's an inferior SPK rather than um, any other. But if it's a recurrent symptom, you, you ought to see that eye and the other eye for uh, a corneal dystrophy, really. So uh, what are the mo uh, most common um, uh, causes of recurrent coronary? So typically they would present with unilateral pain on wakening, waking up, um, lacrimation, photophobia, and sometimes you have a coronal abrasion. And it could it could present to you a bit like this, what, what you've got in the picture. However, it may have uh, healed, but if they give you a, a, a symptom of this having on a recurrent basis, I would definitely look out or take a history of a previous history of trauma. So you can have a traumatic corneal abrasion, which leads to traumatic corneal erosion or, uh, or, um, or corneal dystrophy and map dot dystrophy being the commonest one. It's not uncommon in some people where you don't have um, any other um, history of trauma or in dystrophy, and they're diabetic, and it's, um, I'm not saying it's a poor control, but some people have a bit more neurotrophic cornea and diabetes, and their basement membrane is affected as well. So you can find similar symptoms in uh, diabetics as well. Um, not all, all of them get it, but one of the differential diagnoses. Um, I think um, the most important thing in, um, in recurrent colon rosin is actually based on your treatment, to be honest. Um, nine out of 10 times, they would all settle down with uh, lubrication. So preservative-free, um, you know, not hypermellose. I would say, I'm not saying hypermellose is bad, but um, I, I would go for preservative-free lubrication uh, like sodium halonate in these situations. And uh, you, th there is evidence that if there is any mabomitis or, um, you know, anything which is affecting or, or making the tear film not that good, then you might want to use a course of doxycycline to help it. But more importantly, preservative-free lubrication is what is needed. Um, sometimes if that helps, but doesn't help enough, a trial of four weeks course of bandage contact lens, where you actually keep the bandage contact lens on and see, it almost takes the cycle or the loop away. So you would think, why is bandage contact lens helping? Actually, this just the recurrent cycle of having a recurrent coronal rosin is helped by uh, taking that um, risk of having a, a scratch first thing in the morning, where uh, the 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 um, actually without a bandage contact lens, for example, you could actually have a dryness patch, and it almost opens up when when they wake up in the morning, or sometimes they can be um, they can be awake as a result of the sore um, eye. Um, if that's all tried and still the patient gets it, previously we used to do. Um, something called um, antrostomal puncture, if it's not on the visual axis, where you're actually stimulating a fibrosis and um, hopefully allowing the base membrane to scar up there so that it doesn't um, um, recur um, again. But I, I would say we do less of that now. Um, I would say not debridement, but basically a planned alcohol delamination, i.e. using 20% alcohol, um, and taking the epithelium off in a sheet has been shown to um, 
help the epithelium grow back in a much more, and the I think the recurrence um, definitely reduces by 50%. It's not perfect, but there is some help. Um, if even that is not useful, then excimer laser PTK, uh, where you do alcohol delamination, but smoothen uh, the cornea uh, with, with excimer laser, which is very, very specific. So a typical scenario is I would do a phototherapeutic keratectomy by using an excimer laser, but take 10 microns of tissue away, then look at the bed again on the, on, on the stroma and a Bowman's membrane and stroma. And um, actually, if, if it looks smooth, you can leave it at that. Sometimes I take another five microns and another five microns, and that smoothens the cornea, the epithelium heals. Unfortunately, it's not a cure. It does help. It's the best treatment out there um, for somebody who's not managing or getting recurrent symptoms with, uh, preserve, uh, you know, with um, lubrication. So um, may I just remind you to just mute um, your, uh, just to prevent any background. So um, the, the PTK um, is kind of the, the, the treatment for it, um, though it's not a cure. So I would keep it as a last resort. Um, moving on to more important one, which is corneal infections. Um, I would say um, it's probably uh, a, a topic on its own. And um, I think it's quite important that we um, look at how you get coronal infection. So if you got patent lac lacrimal, um, um, nasolacrimal duct with no problems, a good lid position, uh, there's no ectropion or entropion, no district gases or any eyelashes going in, then overall, that's a good protection. Um, a normal tear film. So somebody who's got who's diabetic and has got lots of SPKs, they're more prone to have an epithelial um, disruption, and then the normal flora becomes a risk factor to the to to an ab, um, you know abnormal coronal epithelium. So quite important to again a normal tear film is important. An intact epithelium is important. There's only some bugs which can go through a normal intact epithelium. So um, typically what will happen is you get dryness, which is quite, and somebody rubs or you put a contact lens on and it causes an abrasion. That intact epithelium, if it's disrupted, then, you, uh, then there is a risk of, um, because the defense mechanism has been affected, then you're, you've got a risk of um, infection. So if somebody has got a coronal abrasion and while it's healing, you want to cover it with antibiotics most of the time to make sure there's no super added infection on that. So all these needs to be in place. And if these are, so whenever you get a coronal infection, you've got to look at systemically to say, is there a patent nasolacrimal duct or there's a um, you know, recurrent epifora in somebody and there's a blocked nasolacrimal duct or uh, is the patient got a very, very poor tear film uh, which can cause abrasion or there is an abrasion uh, itself, which is causing. Um, there are some bugs like Cornebacterium diphtheri. Again, it's not that common. Um, they can penetrate through through an intact epithelium, but it's not that common. Recording in progress. Thanks. Hello, somebody. Um, um, it's okay, okay. Sanjay. I think it's okay. That's fine. So. Um, the commonest cause of coronal infection is bacterial. Um, and least common causes are parasites like acanthamoeba and fungi. But unfortunately, when it happens, uh, you are talking of um, um, almost total blindness and you are talking of corneal transplants in this sort of scenario. But the common ones you face across is bacterial and, um, and viral. Um, but, um, bacterial, as you know, are gram positive and gram negative. And virus, the commonest one you'll come across, which is hopefully not that much of a, is adenoviral or hepatic virus, which I'll come to, come to in a minute. Um, so I was going to ask you before I put this, um, the commonest, by far the commonest cause of contact lens related keratitis in UK. This is a BOSU study. So Royal College of Ophthalmologists, they collected data on 
uh, what are the all the coronal infections from um, ARC or acute referral clinic? Um, where what was the what was the etiology of of that? So uh, there's a BOSIS study which showed that 41.5 percent was related to uh, contact lens use. Um, 9.4 percent um, there was a history of previous either trauma or coronal coronal surgery or a coronal abrasion for some reason. Again, uh, another important cause is surface disease, i.e. patients with Sogren syndrome, recurrent coronal erosion, or patients who have had collagen cross-linking where the epithelium has been affected, um, then you are a bit more prone to get keratitis. As I said, where you don't have an intact epithelium, your normal defense mechanism is broken, and then you, you are more prone to have infection. And this miscellaneous causes as well. So um, this one was a history of somebody who had uh, a, a nail injury and then got infection, um, which, which, which healed quite well, to be fair. Um, uh, this is somebody who um, had a radial keratotomy. So this is surgically induced um, in America and came with an infection on the, on the um, um, line where, when the epithelium was healing. Um, this is somebody who um, a child is born with um, congenital glaucoma. So the pressures are very high. Epithelium was affected and unfortunately got bilateral um, coronal infection. Um, really, really, uh, really bad. And then you can have a small contact lens related um, um, keratitis, as you can see here, to uh, much worse um, you know, if you don't treat it with broad spectrum antibiotics, that small one, which I just showed you before, can change into a, a bit like this, and that will leave a lot of scarring. Um, and there's obviously miscellaneous causes of other, other reasons like secondary to viral infection and neurotrophic keratitis. Um, and, you know, if you get an infection, the first thing to do is actually take a sample and know what the bug is. This um, is a horrible looking cornea on the on on this picture here this patient actually came with a, absolutely almost a spot of um uh, uh keratitis um on monday um and unfortunately was treated with chloramphenicol eye drops four times a day and this was day two the patient came back my vision is getting worse and this is how the cornea was uh, this was a typical pseudomonas keratitis. So gram-negative bacteria have got toxins which can penetrate the cornea. And this needed a corneal graft, which is an emergency corneal graft. I was quite, you know, as a, as a surgeon um, training in Birmingham at the time, I, you know, um, I, I could take the sample. I did an emergency corneal graft because this, this I was going to perforate. Um, and you had to debulk the cornea. But what I'm trying to say is, what could have saved this patient is possibly if a broad spectrum antibiotic like, like exosin uh, or fluoroquinolone was used, uh, maybe uh, the patient may not have had this much of a, a severe infection. So uh, contact lens related infection is quite important to have a broad spectrum antibiotics rather than just a chlorophenicol. So just a just few points I wanted to make, make sure that um, it, it gets across, and I'm sure that's what you would use. But just to say, um, so moving on, it's the same thing here. Um, sometimes the, the, the way it presents gives you a bit of an idea. So um, usually bacterial keratitis is acute presentation. If it's a recurrent one, it's usually herpetic keratitis or subacute presentation. If it's a contaminated contact lens related and particularly with people in swimming pool or, or tap water, um, that's more common with acanthamoeba protozoa. And fungi is usually common in people who have got other, they're diabetic or they're immunosuppressed. Um, and then they, they have a bit more risk of fungi, which is fortunately less common here. Um, so gram positive will look very localized and gram negative looks very diffuse. So you can see a diffuse haze with a hypopian at the bottom, which, is, which means there is a lot of inflammation. So to diagnose, you take a history, you uh, do um, all the examination, and effectively, um, 
you, you when you take the scrapes, uh, you send it uh, to the lab. Depending on whether how big the ulcer is, if there is an ulcer and a hypopian, they need to be admitted. And the reason you need to admit them is because initially it gets worse before it gets better, particularly with the dying bugs, you actually almost get a very, very inflamed eye. And because you want intensive therapy, there is no way, I, I, I did some studies uh, thinking, this, so we, we looked at a collagen shield where you could soak it with antibiotics and put it in uh, on the cornea so that you could actually have antibiotics seeping through the cornea all the time. Um, then you don't need to use half hourly drops. But otherwise, if you, the, the, the infection that I showed you, it's quite important that you need to drop almost uh, a broad spectrum antibiotic half an hour through the night. And that's why I think that they need to be admitted. And particularly if things are getting worse or things are not improving, then you may have to have a plan B and plan A. So outpatient appointment in the, those sort of scenario is a bit more difficult. But by and large, if it's a localized keratitis, no hypopian, you can manage it as, a, as an outpatient. And um, usually cefiroxime and gentamicin is something which we use as a broad spectrum, which is only uh, available in the hospitals. But if, if, it is a, if it is a localized contact lens or non-contact lens, localized keratitis, a broad spectrum like exosin, a fluoroquinone is good enough. Um, because we're going through a corneal journey, I just, uh, I'm going to touch on some viral keratitis as well. And I hope um, this is again, you'll probably find, or you can have, I, I'm very happy to have questions if you have any questions on this. But the common one is an adenoviral kerat uh, um, keratitis, which patient presents with follicular conjunctivitis. You can have some glands, pain, photophobia. To be honest, nine out of 10 times, doesn't need any treatment. They, um, um, if it's on the visual axis, then you might think of using a, a, a lubrication with an FML or um, a, some sort of um, topical steroids to help it, but not, not otherwise. So if it's right in the visual axis and it's, it's affecting the visual acuity, and um, then, then you might have to consider that. Um, moving on to herpetic keratitis, which is more common, um, the, the biggest difference I wanted to point out in this uh, presentation is really the difference between an epithelial disease versus a stromal disease. So um, as we know, cornea has epithelium, Bowman's membrane, stroma, uh, Desmus membrane, endothelium. If it affects only the epithelium, the way uh, the herpetic virus, it almost forms little bulbs and it almost forms as a dendrite, which is typical here. And if you go to one of the bulb and take a, take a sample and send for PCR, you'll get a herpes virus infection part. It's quite diagnostic to see this. The only thing I would say to this is, if you've got somebody who's diabetic and a coronal abrasion is healing, sometimes actually it can look like a, a healing coronal abrasion can look like a dendrite. Now, it's not always as classical as this in the picture. So that's sometimes, if, if in doubt though, I would treat it as an abrasion, but see, see them back in, in 24 to 48 hours. And if it's not healing or getting worse, then obviously you need to uh, treat it as... Um, I, the downside with um, treating them... So um, I, I know it's not... It's, it's a virtual one, um, but if it was face-to-face, -face, I would have said, you know, if you actually have... A, if in doubt, for example, if you think, well, you know, the history doesn't tie up, there's no other symptoms, um, why would the patient get herpetic keratitis? And it looks like a maybe an abrasion, maybe a dendritic ulcer. I would rather not treat it as dendritic ulcer to start with. And the reason is, you once you've labeled somebody with herpetic dendritic ulcer, means um, it's, it's obviously come, come in the nerves, it's a recurrent thing, you've got to tell them forever that if you get a recurrent, so you get labeled as a herpetic um, dendritic ulcer. A healing abrasion, I would treat them as a healing abrasion if, if, in, if you're in doubt. And then um, if it doesn't heal, then you've got to treat, and then you say, well, at least it's no herpetic keratitis. 
the the other option we have got is we we do have option of taking a a sample of for PCR, which you may or may not have. So, um, hence dendritic ulcer. Um, so epithelial disease needs to be treated with only ointment. It doesn't need to be or or or, or drops, but not systemic. Usually not systemic. And the typical treatment is gancyclovir or acyclovir, what, whatever is present, um, uh, for usually a week. Um, the reason you want to see them back is if the epithelium is healed, to be honest, then acyclovir or gancyclovir is so toxic to the cornea that you get a lot of SPKs and things. So the first opportunity you, you want uh, them to stop, you would stop it, basically, rather than continuing it just in case, no just in case means it is going to be more toxic to the cornea. So once the epithelium is healed, no more treatment. Um, this is the days where, um, and I, 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 this is, this is um, in gut navel that I've, I've seen this patient where um, um, patient um, had dendritic ulcer and then angiographic ulcer because was treated with steroids. Um, this patient had previous history of uveitis and, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, the GP didn't have access to any instruments or, um, you know, slit lamp. And because of the previous history of uveitis, patient was given um, a, a steroid drop. So the the dendritic ulcer then on the left one, the lower left one, has become a geographic ulcer. Uh, the downside with that is actually slightly more difficult to treat them. Um, so um, I had to divide that and use acyclovir tablets and acyclovir ointment to help it, there is a slightly more increased risk of melting and slightly more risk of uh, scarring in these patients. Hopefully, uh, geographic ulcer is almost gone now. We don't see much uh, very often um, because of the access uh, to uh, yourselves where you, you see on the slit lamp rather than actually um, having previous history. So, um, what would you treat geographic ulcer with is usually debridement, um, topical and oral acyclovir. And th this is where, um, because it can affect the stroma, you're kind of preventing oral uh, with oral acyclovir as well. The story with stromal keratitis is quite different. So um, this patient has got, um, this patient has got, um, and uh, um, you, you, can, you can see um, there is a, a edema, there is a, a haze in the cornea, and unless otherwise proven, I would say if you see a corneal edema with um, haze, um, the commonest infection um, is herpetic keratitis, and what we're um, thinking of herpetic stromal keratitis. Um, you've got to check the corneal sensation. If the sensation is reduced, it's more likely. Um, but they are treated very differently because um, it's an immune reaction of, of, of the cornea to the virus. You need to treat it with steroids with acyclovir tablets cover rather than acyclovir ointment. You do not need acyclovir ointment if there's no epithelium involvement. So the treatment here is... Stromal keratitis is, um, and they can present with um, stromal edema, sometimes keratic precipitate, iritis, and can lead to scarring, um, is topical um, steroids with um, acyclovir um, medication uh, orally. 400 milligram BD uh, for um, a week, and then 400 OD for up to three months, depending on um, how it's resolving. Um, corneal involvement can be, a, it, it can almost mimic uh, a, a numular keratitis, which is actually a bit like uh, adenoviral keratitis. So overall, uh, the treatment, um, uh, again, that was her herpes simplex, but zoster, um, it depends on where it's in, um, where it's affecting. If it's stromal, you've got to treat it with oral acyclovir and steroids. And if it's epithelial, then treat with epithelial only. So now that um, I've just gone through uh, a first part of the presentation, I thought I'm going to ask you uh, some, some interesting questions and uh, hopefully 
if Victoria is there, we will actually get um, some ready. poll questions. Ready with poll one. Good. So this is uh, a 65 year old uh, who presented with a foreign body sensation, blurred vision, and I hope you can see um, that there is uh, a change in the cornea and there's a slit lamp view to see uh, showing something. There's no history of trauma. There's no history of foreign body. Um, um, can we have the poll question, please? So what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Is this bacterial keratitis? Is this fungal keratitis? Is this herpetic keratitis or most likely to be herpetic keratitis, fungal or, or bacterial? We're up to 54 out of 67. So I'll just keep it going a little bit longer. We've got eight to go. Anybody want to give it a last go who hasn't guessed yet? That's pretty good. Um, so, so I think I, I would have wanted. Um, uh, so, um, it's it's you know it's 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 a bit difficult to be honest. The history is very small, and you've only got a snapshot of that picture. I I would say, though bacterial keratitis is possible. Um, but it's very diffuse. There is no other history of, uh, you know, the intact epithelium or foreign body, or any other um, history uh, around. So slightly less likely of bacterial keratitis, but can be a bacterial keratitis. Fungal is very un unusual because there is no other history. Um, but but you know, again, there is nothing on the cornea where it, it will be one of the keratitis. But most likely, as I was saying to you before that if you see a stromal edema or a, a KP with stromal edema with KP, unless otherwise proven, always think herpetic keratitis first. So take a history, uh, check the coronal sensation. Actually, um, more likely than not, um, it, is, it is her. So if I saw this patient and there was no other symptoms, the eye was reasonably white and quiet, there's no, um, I wouldn't treat it as I would cover it with second for second infection, but most likely would be treated as herpetic keratitis. Now, it is it is a snapshot, so I wouldn't say that you know bacterial keratitis is wrong, but most likely this would be treated as herpetic keratitis. Good. So the next um, question is. This patient presented to eye casualty. Uh, the history, he's an 85 year old. He complains of brow ache, nausea and blurred vision. He felt uh, preceding this, he had some degree of um, almost like a migraine or headache um, more during evening driving, but actually then came with a brow, a brow ache, nausea and blurred vision. Actually the vision in this eye uh, was reduced to uh, 624. Um, there were uh, on the top there is some edema, and you can see slightly uh, a, a fixed dilated pupil. Um, so, can I have uh, the options, please? What do you think this is? Um, iritis, angle closed glaucoma. If I said there was a history of previous injury, traumatic madrasis, or optic neuritis. I think this is on to Can you see the results as they're coming up, Sanjay? Mm -hmm. Yep, I can. Okay. So I think I've got 61 out of 67, 91% responded. And I think um, everybody's most of people have hit, uh, I, I think iritis is a diagnosis, is a, is a differential diagnosis for sure. Um, but um, with a history of previous headache, and um, um, I would say uh, most likely this is angle closed glaucoma. 
Uh, and how would you treat this? You would actually um, uh, treat it with um, reducing, immediately reducing with IV diamox or acetazolamide, bringing the pressure down with topical antibiotics as well. Once the pressure is down, so this patient presented with pressures of 68 and the other eye was about uh, 24. So um, what we did was brought the pressure down, uh, got the corneal edema down with uh, topical and systemic uh, anti-glaucoma treatment. And the next day, uh, the patient was admitted, next day uh, we used pilocarpin to make the pupil a bit smaller. The right eye, this eye did not respond much. The other one, and we did a YAG PI, um, which is a, a laser, YAG laser peripheral aerodectomy uh, to reduce, but that itself was not enough because when you check the actual length, the length of the eyeball, um, the, the lens was quite thick. So the lens thickness was more than 25% of uh, the length of the eyeball. So we decided after the pressure was down and YAG PI was done uh, to take the lens out and that, that sorted it out basically. So the answer to this one is ankle closed glaucoma. Thank you very much. Next one. Um, so the next case, this 35 year old, um, there's a two, two month history of right red eye. Um, um, the, you know, has been to the GP, started um, chloramphenicol, but unresponsive to chloramphenicol. This is a lower palpable conjunctiva. And you can see um, that otherwise the bulbar conjunctiva is white, but there is significant changes in the um, uh, palpable conjunctiva. So, um, sorry, um, the poll questions, please. So do you think this is bacterial conjunctivitis? Do you think this is allergic conjunctivitis? Do you think this is viral conjunctivitis, which is not uncommon? Or do you think this is something dodgy, chlamydia conjunctivitis? Somebody's graffiti in your, your slide there, Sandy. I know, ah. I know. I know, how is that? That is, I mean, that's, what's the word? Vandalism. <laughs> Corneal presentation vandalism. <laughs> <laughs> Up to 56. That's so, good. So I just end that there? Yep. So, yeah, I think allergic conjunctivitis is, is, is the right differential diagnosis. It's quite a common um, viral as well is not um, uncommon. This particular uh, patient, we took a, a swab and it was chlamydia conjunctivitis and responded very well to tetracycline. And we had to refer the patient to a GU clinic as well, which is part of the thing that you have to do uh, with full oral um, oral course that they have to. But yeah, um, unilateral um, papillary conjunctivitis, not responsive to uh, normal medications, always think of chlamydia conjunctivitis and, and go in detail taking history. Um, so I hope um, you found that a bit uh, interesting. So I'm going to move on to my next part of the presentation. And I just thought keratoconus is something which is quite important and uh, you come across um, from time to time. And I'm, I'm sure when you when you first tell them, there's a lot of questions. Uh, and one of the questions everybody asks, at least me when they see me in Keratoconus Clinic, is why have I got it? And unfortunately, um, there is no specific clear reason. Um, and uh, there is obviously, with all the research that's done, um, the commonest explanation you can give is chronic habit of abnormal rubbing. Uh, CHAR is the main reason which causes temperature increase uh, inflammatory mediators are increased in tear films, which causes slippage of the corneal fibrils and started almost causing a herniation. Um, it's a bit like uh, you, you, you start getting thinner and weaker uh, at the apex, and that's supposed to cause uh, keratoconus. Quite unusual, but 
basically um, it, it's, it's the most um, accepted uh, etiology for keratoconus. It's commonly associated with atopic disease, um, history of atopy, people um, who have, whoever has got immune globulin disease, so I know it's, it's a big heavy word, but it's IgE, one of the, um, they seem to have hay fever, asthma, eczema, um, all of these together, or either of them, uh, which almost, if you've got hay fever, you rub your eyes a lot more, um, that causes um, or has to be associated or um, is associated more uh, with uh, with keratoconus. Down syndrome, um, uh, I um, the number of uh, Down syndrome that I've seen who um, have got keratoconus, I, I, I almost get surprised if I see a Down syndrome um, who's, who's referred to me for cataract, for example, and you do a scan and you look at the, um, and they've always uh, had, think, well, my vision was poor, they almost always uh, have keratoconus. I'm not saying always, but they are associated more significantly with keratoconus. Some connective tissue disease like LR Danlos and things are also associated, but more importantly, eye rubbing is quite important and um, has been reported in 66% of cases. Um, so, um, as you know, um, if you got uh, about about 15 years ago, the, the best thing we would say, stop eye rubbing, glasses, contact lenses, and if that doesn't help, if the vision is uh, getting worse, then you uh, use corneal transplant. Um, there's nothing else that was available. What's changed in the last few years is, is the concept about understanding a bit more about the pathology. And as you can see on the left, the collagen, the weaker it is, if you can see how the, uh, the vertical uh, spacing uh, keeps bigger and it makes it a bit more thinner. And if you cross-link the cornea, how it becomes a bit more stronger. Um, so the collagen uh, cross-linking is kind of, has changed the management of um, keratoconus. But in terms of, what implication it's got for you and me is we need to monitor any keratoconus. We need to identify, the earlier we identify, the better it is. So previously, if you've got keratoconus, you may or may not have a topography to, to explain. You see a scissoring reflex on, on, on retinoscopy, or you have somebody whose vision is not improving, and you think, well, do you know why is not improving refraction? Uh, it's got plus two cell, but actually still a 612. Um, I think I would keep a low threshold to get a corneal topography to before saying that's, that's amblyopia, which is quite important for that. Um, but if you do have a new diagnosis of keratoconus, they need um, um, monitoring so that, um, and the reason they need monitoring is if it's a progressive condition, you can avoid progression by asking them to stop um, rubbing and doing a collagen cross-linking. And um, that, that, that's the thing which has changed uh, our management. And we do corneal transplants for um, keratoconus um, much, much, much less, almost, almost less than 20% of what we used to do 15 years ago um, because we can now stop the progression. So um, there's obviously a criteria which is not needed for you, but just saying, um, there is, if, if astigmatism changes by 1.5 diopters, if there's more than um, one line loss of corrected visual acuity or um, difference in K-max, which is the um, steepness of the cornea, they need to be referred for collagen cross-linking, which is, which is what we do uh, in the hospital eye service. So what do we do with collagen cross-linking? I do an accelerated protocol. We originally started with a, uh, an hour of treatment, 30 minutes of riboflavin uh, drop. So we take the epithelium off, riboflavin drops and ultraviolet light, 30 minutes each. Um, luckily, we could use the maths and there's an accelerated protocol where you put 10 minutes of riboflavin and eight minutes of UVA, but actually the, the, the formula is slightly changed, but the amount of energy that goes to help cross-link the cor uh, cornea is exactly the same. So we use an ultraviolet light A and 
um, the applications have got a little video. So basically, it's a very simple treatment. What you do is, um, uh, this is uh, alcohol well, you're putting 20% alcohol for 40 seconds. So what you're trying to do is taking the epithelium off very um, smoothly. You can take the, so you've made the epithelium loose. So then you've exposed the Bowman's and stroma. And then the next um, 10 minutes, all you're doing is using this yellow riboflavin dye to soak. Um, so that goes through all the layers of the cornea. And um, effectively, you're doing this while you're chatting to the patient, and then um, ultraviolet A light to expose the cornea. Um, and that, um, after that, you put a bandage contact lens. Um, no, sorry. Before that, you put um, dexamethasone steroid um, um, antibiotics, and then bandage contact lens. And unfortunately, the main problem is it is painful because you've you've taken the epithelium off. So. Uh, there is a lot of abrasion, so it, it can be very painful afterwards. But we need to prepare the patient. We sometimes give them uh, an anesthetic drop for desperate situation for that night and the next day. And we see them usually day four to take the, uh, take the bandage contact lens off. They almost always will have a haze. It stabilizes the cornea. I always say to the patient, this is not to improve the vision. All we're doing is stabilizing the cornea to prevent progression. The only way you can get better vision is corrected glasses or contact lenses, which may be RGP or um, Kerasoft or a special keratoconic lenses after three months, because then the case um, or, or, or the shape becomes a bit more stable. But up to three months, if you see them, more likely you'll say, oh, my vision is worse than what it was originally, because they get a haze. You actually have a, um, um, the thickening of this uh, collagens uh, causes a haze. For me, a haze post collagen cross linking means the treatment is working. So it's nothing to worry about. I've got a question to ask on behalf of a, an uh -huh. optimist. That's okay. Um, when removing a metallic corneal foreign body and yeah. a rest ring remains, how much of a rest ring is it safe to leave? And what is the likelihood of long term problems relating to the unremoved rest ring? I don't think it's a, it's a big problem. I would still try it. I would um, I would take the main bulk of the metal foreign body. Um, if you can, at the same time, reduce the uh, rust ring, that's okay. Um, if it's if it's quite significant and it's quite unsightly, right in the um, near the visual in the pupillary area, then I would use the, get them to use antibiotic. Call them back in about three days or two to three days time. Sometimes it comes sometimes or more than uh, it comes a bit more superficial and you can try it again. But you know, otherwise, it's amazing how uh, an iron uh, deposition of other things, you know, there's, it's not visually significant. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it as long as you've taken the main metal foreign body out. But if it is too unsightly, I would definitely try it three days again and try and see if you can do a deeper one. I hope that answers it. So, uh, carrying on the same, um, we we use a contact lens, we use an anti antibiotic and anti inflammatory and pain relief afterwards, um, and there's enough evidence to sh show now that collagen cross linking is very safe and it's the best treatment for a progressive keratoconus. Um, th these are some data. Uh, nothing is uh, risk free. No operation is risk free, and um, people who've got very, very um, significant eczema, I find they almost um, a lot of times will get inflammatory deposit after a, a treatment. Um, I've actually had recently uh, two or three who's got very severe eczema. They've been treated with uh, with dermatologist, but actually in spite of me um, seeing them day one, day four, I couldn't avoid uh, some peripheral scars that they, they got afterwards, but actually of no significance, but um, they get um, very strong inflammatory immune response um, in eczema uh, after collagen cross-linking because you've taken the epithelium off. You've almost invited all the immune cells to come there. But, um, but you can get infection as well. As I said, if you take the epithelium off, your defense mechanism is uh, gone. We do cover it with very um, strong off-the-quicks. Basically, it's a fluoroquinolone, which, um, which um, is supposed to prevent infection, but you can still get it. Risk is small. Could I just so, come in 
Another question on cross-linking. Uh -huh. what, what would you consider, no, sorry, would you consider LASIK correction at the same time as cross-linking? I'm not a big fan of that. I think uh, I've got, um, I've got, um, there is, sorry, I'm going to go back a bit. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I have done it and uh, um, there is a, a, a gentleman called John Canopoulos from, uh, who's um, done an Athens protocol. And where I use it is um, where you've got a very regular cornea, you are not achieving anything from, um, from regular cornea. So I would use um, a collagen cross-linking, then regularize the cornea so that the patient can use a normal contact lens or, or, or glasses for improvement of vision. So regularity of the cornea can be affected. But he does use, um, if he's if you've got a borderline or early um, sort of form first take keratoconus with somebody who's, who's myopic as well, uh, what he would do is collagen cross-link them and then three months later do, um, do um, PRK or laser treatment to help their um, uh, prescription. Um, because his trend in the cornea and then monitor them up to up to four years, um, which actually he's got enough papers to prove it. I don't think um, one of the reasons, one of the main contraindications for laser for me is keratoconus. So I probably wouldn't jump at it. It's only very, very selective cases, which I've done from Garth Naval actually, um, because I've had few keratoconus who are contact lens intolerant um, don't achieve good vision with 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 glasses. Then I would regularize the cornea, then do collagen cross-linking. So the excimer laser I've done is mainly to regularize the cornea, and then they're back to either glasses or or contact lenses. Which um, well, they, they 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 couldn't have used the contact lenses because they're contact lens intolerant in the first place. So the answer to that is there is um, um, and 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 there is a consultant. At, at Moorfields who does it as well. And I've done one patient who had first eye done with him and second eye, I did it here. But again, it's not, it's not a regular treatment. It's in very selected cases. Um, so in terms of referral, I would say it, whether it's to NHS or privately, um, you should think about a new diagnosis of keratoconus, you should refer first to establish baseline and everything. A progressive keratoconus for sure. Um, and they all need refraction keratometry topography. It is a bit time sensitive in which case is, is if somebody came to me and the coronal thickness was 385, I would say, actually, I wish I'd seen you before. Um, and then if I'd seen you before, uh, so the corneal thickness less than 400, when you use the ultraviolet lies, uh, light, there is evidence that you might induce cataract and retinal toxicity. So less than 400, you don't do uh, collagen cross-linking. There are some ways now we're trying to swell up the cornea while we're treating, but effectively from your point of view, 400 is a cutoff. So um, that becomes a bit of a medical legal issue where people say, well, why was I not referred earlier? Um, and that's the same case with us um, where if you've got peripheral hospitals where they don't have a keratoconus service, uh, they, they, I've, you know, we've increased them to as well to refer early rather than later. So effectively, a new diagnosis or a new to your practice where it's a keratoconus, I would first get them to uh, come back through hospitalized service. I typically ask them to take contact lens off at least for a week. And if there are RGP, then at least two weeks. But it's difficult to get RGP keratoconic patients to take contact lenses off. Um, this was just to show uh, what a normal corneal topography, a pentacam, or um, looks like of an astigmatism. So uh, you can see the lower one, which shows a bow tie. Um, it's not the same as keratoconus, which is asymmetric and almost like a sagging um, um, sign inferiorly or teardrop sign. So I've got a case here for you. Um, this 10 year old, he attended an optician and he was having problems in class when he was looking at the blackboard. Um, I'm looking at the time here as well. Um, so he was seen by an optometrist and he was advised um, right eye could not be improved. It was 612 minus two, I think. 
left eye was myopic and he was given a prescription. The parents were not happy. And I would, now that I know about this um, um, history, um, the optometrist who, were see, who saw first did an autorefractor and, and basically a foropter refraction. Um, so they went to a second opin uh, opinion from another uh, experienced optometrist. And he referred this patient to me. Um, his history was he had passed the nursery test, um, but noticed a deterioration. My refraction is showing me that there is a, a sill in the right one. Left eye is not too much uh, of, but, um, and he could improve only up to 6.7.6. Six. Um, but because of the K readings, um, so I've written it in radius of curvature, which you guys are used to, um, 6.8 and 7.5 um, was the reading. So I wanted to ask you, um, I think my poll question was supposed to come here, wasn't it? Um, um, this is the one wait. that um, has just, it's just free flowing answers. People are yes. just- Yes, please. Yeah. So um, did I not have a question there, did I? Well, we just set up in case people didn't want to respond. We've got an A, B, C, and D that you can assign answers to. But I think yeah. we were going to see first if people just wanted to use answer this. Yeah, yeah. So could you put that up? That's great. So if if you would, if anybody would like to answer this one, just use your chat function. And if you don't mind replying to everyone, or if if you, no, I had I had a question though, didn't I? I, I wrote a question though. Oh, Wait. I know what you mean. Sorry. So okay. we have, we That's have, right. What is yeah. the most likely diagnosis of this 10 year old and what is the best management? So if you can use your comments box for that and um, we shall see what comes in. So while, while um, you are, um, um, I've got Sinead asking this question, can cross-linking be repeated? Answer is yes. If so, after how long? It's difficult to say, I, I've not had to repeat yet. Um, but um, it can be repeated uh, usually after a year. Uh, but if it's if it's moving after a year, I'm a bit I'm a bit worried. Um, um, uh, um, that you know if it's progressing even after crosslinking, then I would be a bit worried if it's so quickly. So typically, I would say usually in a few years time, but it can be repeated after a year. So we've got some suggestions yeah, there. Yeah, I can see. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at that as well. So it's good. Amblyopia and keratocone. I think that's that's very, very true. Uh, you can't say either unless you actually have, um, you know, um, all, all the keratoconus contact lens initially, right? A keratoconus try cross-linking, early keratoconus, repeat refraction, case in three months. That's, that's fair enough. Um, I think, um, yeah, keratoconus right eye refer. Um, likely keratoconus prescribed glasses and refer. Um, suspect keratoconus due to K readings. Um, I think that's that's good. I, I think um, this is where kind of what I was hoping. Um, basically, um, I, I would have to add this. The optician who referred me um, had said to, to the patients, and he was was a bit worried uh, to give a diagnosis because he didn't have the topography, but he did notice a scissoring reflex. So, but you've got to understand this is a 10 year old. It's not that common. Um, you know, you don't come across keratoconic uh, 10 year old. So I think uh, suspect keratoconus routine referral after case. I think I, I, I totally agree. Suspect keratoconus is probably um, and and amblyopia is not a wrong thing. However, that's an excluded. That's a diagnosis by exclusion rather than anything else. So, um, this patient, uh, when when he arrived at me, uh, I, you know, in in the clinic, you could see um, you could see very obviously compared. If I show you uh, a normal, um, remember I was showing you the left lower one, which looks like a symmetric one. Um, and very smooth. Um, if I then compare this with, with the, it's very obvious that this um, almost like a hotspot right in the center, 
and this is a 10 year old and coronal thickness is 474. Um, um, there's a couple of other parameters that we look at um, on the right hand corner. If you see um, there's some values 2021, 20, that should be less, well, usually it's less than 10. Um, and the, the right lower one, uh, the value is less than 15 and it's about 40. So this is a very, in on terms of coronal topography, this is a barn door obvious keratoconus for me. The same thing in the left eye, the vision is 6.5. So my question was, uh, my question to everyone, what should I do? This is a 10 year old and, uh, and he has a new diagnosis of keratoconus. He's obviously not needing any glasses before, and now he needs a plus minus 2.5 sill in the right one. Left eye is very good. Um, and um, But I can see a keratoconus. Look at the coronal thickness. Coronal thickness is better in this one, 499. But I can see the other parameters, which is all pointing that left eye has got form first day keratoconus, which means subclinical keratoconus. So I you know, for me, an obvious one is the right eye needs to be discussed about collagen cross-linking. And the first question the the um, uh, the parents asked me, um, would you have to do it again? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, but most likely, yes, because it's 10 year old, the eyes keep on growing till at least you're 21 to 25. And it if 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 I do the college cross linking, if it needs to be repeated, we will repeat it. My main question, my main challenge was actually discussing about the left eye. So to be honest, if it is my son, I would do both because I would like to maintain the left six five vision as it is, but there are risks with anything you do. So I did offer to them right eye collagen cross linking and monitoring the left eye, but not too long. And um, I ended up doing both eyes about four months apart. And I've monitored him, I think it's been year four, year three, I think. There's not much of a change, but it might change. And I have to be prepared to not jump at it, but actually maybe if, if it's constantly progressing, then I might have to re um, uh, cross link it. Um, I'm hoping uh, not soon, but I never, uh, I, I'm not so sure at the moment. So yeah, um, the patient, so somebody's written, uh, Kerry's written collagen bilaterally now, and I think that's what the, the management was. Um, and the, the results, as I say, is, is very good, but this patient guaranteed would have needed a corneal transplant had we not had collagen cross-linking uh, because he's so, he was so young today. The interesting thing is, He's got a brother. I did his scans. Uh, I did a screening scan for him. He didn't have it. His dad came. His mom came. I did their uh, pentacam uh, or coronal topography. They, but interesting, one of the visits, his grandfather was there. And, and he said, oh, my optometrist has told me my left eye has got cut. My right eye is no good at all. So I don't want to uh, discuss about the right eye. Anyway, I did a scan on him. And he had a absolutely... Um, very advanced keratoconus in the right eye, which was his, you know, uh, in those days, about about uh, 40 years ago, was his amblyopic eye. That was a keratoconic eye. And uh, the other eye had early keratoconus, but not, not, not much, and luckily stayed like that and had a cataract, basically. So it skipped a generation, but there was a family history. So I thought that was interesting to discuss. So I'm... Um, that probably brings me to some um, sort of common things um, in, in terms of coronal journey. I mean, I can ca carry on this coronal journey all evening if if you have the time. But I, I've been I've been told by Narasha and and Vic not to carry on more than an hour. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of things: epithelial dystrophy, the one I was talking about when I started recurrent coronal rosin. It's a lot more common than you think. It's subtle you may have to slightly diffuse your slit lamp um, and see that, um, but you will actually find if you look for it, particularly in recurrent coronal rosin, it's a lot more common than you think. 
and PTK is the answer to this if they are symptomatic. Um, uh, the other thing which I quite like is I previously used to only do pterygium. I had this, this very interesting patient who had a map dot dystrophy. So this is my lovely drawing. Um, this is a map dot dystrophy um, causing recurrent coronal erosion and a pterygium, and he wanted both treated. And if you look at the topography, the pterygium had caused a significant irregular astigmatism. So I did an excimer laser PTK and removed the pterygium at the same time, and the patient had very, very good results. But I, I just thought that was very interesting um, to have a coexistent uh, map dot dystrophy with, with pterygium. Well, pterygium normally I would treat it surgically to excise. Um, one point of note on pterygium is if you see a pterygium, which is which is fortunately not that common uh, in the Western world, but if it does come, I wouldn't wait till it goes very near the pupil because then you get a subepithelial scarring and then you're left with that scarring forever and it causes irregular astigmatism. So I'm, I'm not saying very early because there's chance of recurrence, but if it's moderate about uh, more than 1 to 2, 1.2 millimeters onto from the limbus, I would, I would get it seen. Uh, to discuss about surgical um, accession. So very happy to take any further questions. I have tried to restrict myself uh, to 50, 60 slides, but I'm very happy to discuss any further if you've got questions. Um, I've had one that sent in to me. I will just say that anybody that needs to go at eight, please, please feel free to do so. Um, but anybody that would like to ask a few questions, please feel free to, to, to stay. Um, there's one question here from, from somebody who has said that both her brothers have keratoconus. Is there a genetic or a family link? So I did a big study on this, actually. So um, uh, in short, the answer is uh, there is increased chance, but I couldn't prove a genetic association. So I spent um, three weekends um, at in Birmingham where we thought um, uh, we would we would get all the keratoconic database from in Birmingham Eye Hospital, and did bloods for them, and and all the markers, and got a geneticist involved. Um, but looking at that, there was definitely more preponderance and cousins and and family members. But it's not like glaucoma where there's dominant pattern, and everybody should be screened for keratoconus. But I do find there is no doubt that. Um, keratoconus does run in families and it uh, if if somebody has got that for example um uh, whoever has asked me this question if their um um let's say brother has um keratoconus and they come to me for laser i would say i would not treat you with laser just in case you are late in developing keratoconus um so what i'm trying to say is there is more chances of um family members developing signs of keratoconus than um, somebody who's got no family history. But the relationship is not the same uh, as you've got in glaucoma. But, uh, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time about this. Um, I, I wouldn't exactly say uh, in, in terms of evidence there is a genetic link, but there's definitely more preponderance in families. Um, okay, I have a question about a specific patient, a 13-year-old girl who has quite bad blepharitis, yeah. current styes. She has also got small inferior right corneal opacities. It right. looks like something toxic, but she's only using preservative-free dry eye drops. Any thoughts? I've given her antihistamine drops and will review soon as she also has yeah. GPC. I, I would say this is very much sounding like vernal keratoconjunctivitis. I would I would probably get one uh, corneal opinion uh, because they might need um, on and off uh, opatinol, on and off topical steroids, preservative free, on and off possibly cyclosporin if this is a recurrent thing. So I would I would get that one seen once uh, because if there's any corneal um, involvement. I would actually get get I get them seen, particularly if they uh, most likely is vernal keratoconjunctivitis. She said, "Thank you. That's great advice." No problem. 
I don't think we have any other questions. If anybody's in the middle of typing a, a, a long question, just let us know so we don't cut you off. I'll use this time just now to say thank you very much, Mr. Mantry, for giving the talk. Um, and I will send out feedback forms either later tonight or tomorrow. If you can complete them and send them back to me, then I will send you your certificate um, so that you can uh, so that you can upload it to the GOC. I've just noticed a question here that says, is there an age limit for CXL? Uh, no, no, there's no age limit for CXL. I've treated a 10 year old and I've treated a 65 year old because the 65 year old had had eczema and his progression. So progression is the criteria for a uh, thing. Um, thank you all, uh, everyone, uh, for um, spending the evening with us and um, have a good evening. <laughs>